admit that your word confronts us. You're calling us into something. You're calling us away from ourselves to live in the freedom of your love. So Lord, let it rattle around our hearts and head and let us struggle with the hard things, guiding us into living in your love, in your way. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things I love about the book of Acts is that it allows us to see just how messy Christian faith really is. For some reason, we humans like to have everything nailed down in black and white thinking. Yes, in, out. We tend to want to be like the Jewish leaders of Jesus' day, have a good set of rule book to follow. Frankly, this kind of a desire comes from our own sinful nature. We want to be in control. We want to decide what's okay and what's not okay. We want to be the judge. And just when we think we have it figured out, the Holy Spirit busts in and opens up the the edges and shakes everything up. This is the book of Acts. We just listened, in my opinion, to one of the most bizarre stories in the book of Acts. You have to take that this is a bit unusual. An angel of the Lord shows up to Philip and says, Philip, my man, I want you to go down this road. It's the road from Jerusalem down to Gaza. Okay, why? Folks, this is the first days of the church. The community doesn't understand who they are yet, except that they're following Jesus. Why would Philip leave the small community of believers in Jerusalem? Except that the word of the Lord was given to him through an angel to go. And where he's going to go is a road that goes from Jerusalem, goes out into the countryside, heading down to Gaza. And Gaza is the last stop before the the desert between Israel and Egypt. Why? But he goes. Counterintuitive, wouldn't you say? Kind of weird. He goes because he's been sent by God. And then on the road he sees a very specific person while he's out there in the wilderness. The guy is an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace of Ethiopia. Now that just rattles right off the lips. For those of us who church are churchy, uh, churchy nerds, that's kind of fun language. An Ethiopian eunuch who worked for the Candace of Ethiopia. Ah! Ethiopian. He's not an Israelite. He's not a typical Jewish person. He was in fact most likely black, and he was obviously from a different culture. If that's not enough, he was a eunuch. Now, we don't use that term a whole lot today, but it's a good biblical term, and it's one that even is fun to say. Eunuch. Can you say that? Eunuch. There you go. We hear the word, but we don't think much about it. It almost rolls off our lips, but it tells us a lot. This man had been castrated. A man whose gender identity had been altered. Now, do the historical study. You'll discover there are a few ways this happens. Indeed, some are born this way. Some, this is performed on them by somebody else. And for some, they choose it themselves. Now, the results of that, their hormones are different. 
They're more congenial. They're more um, relaxed and less arrogant. It's a way of life, a changing way of life. So he's also employed by the Candace of Ethiopia, which means the queen of Ethiopia. He's a powerful international figure. Wow. Eight chapters into the book of Acts, and this is where we are at. What is the Holy Spirit up to? Why is Philip sent to encounter this man? And note that it is the Holy Spirit that prompts Philip to not just see the guy, but to engage the eunuch in conversation. This is a powerful moment. A moment worth our looking at. Why would God's Holy Spirit be encouraging Philip to share the gospel with a eunuch? Here are some other realities. A eunuch could not enter fully into the temple in Jerusalem where he had gone to worship. He was only allowed so far because good Old Testament law had a rule. Deuteronomy 23.1 No one whose testicles are crushed or penis is cut off shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. It's in there, folks. There you go. There's a sweet Old Testament word for us. There you have it. This person who journeyed from Ethiopia to Jerusalem could not be fully present in worship and was, by definition, a non-person in the eyes of the Jewish world of that day. In black and white thinking, this is enough evidence, right? The eunuch is to be overlooked and dismissed, (laughs) except that the Holy Spirit says no. In this account, we witness God's love, the gospel of Jesus, rushing outward to those who are marginalized and pushed down by others in culture. The gospel is for them, too. We have no proven historic documentation about what happens next after this encounter, except there is a tradition in the life of the Ethiopian church which says that their way of hearing the gospel came through a eunuch who had been to Jerusalem and had an encounter with Philip. The Ethiopian church is one of the most ancient of the Christian churches, and they hold their connection to Christ through the word that was proclaimed by this guy. I ask you this morning, how often does our desire for black and white thinking hold us back from sharing and accepting and honoring others? What we witness in this Acts account is the messiness of the early church and the permission of the Holy Spirit to live in the messiness of life. And in those early years, the church did this. So as I was struggling through this text and doing my due diligence of study, I caught wind of a theologian. His name is Origen. How many of you have ever heard of Origen? I thought so. He's one of the early church fathers. He was born in year 185, And he was born in Alexandria in Egypt. He was the son of Leonides and his mother. I don't have the mother's name. But he was a Christian. He was raised by Christian parents. When Origen was 16 years of age, his father was arrested in one of the persecutions. He was arrested and put in jail. Origen wanted to go and be with his father in jail. Now, understand, all the Christians understood what this meant. If you've been arrested for your faith, your life is on the line. Origen's mother begged him not to go and went so far. Now, this is a little weird. She hid all his clothing 
so he couldn't go out in public. Leonides was killed for his faith. And they confiscated all of his possessions and property. Suddenly, 16-year-old Origen finds himself now the one responsible for his mother's well-being in life, and they have nothing except their faith. Then a rich female patron chose him to bless him and take care of him and provide for him. Origen had been given by his family a traditional Greek education, which means he was given the best education of the day. And this woman encouraged more. And Origen became one of the most gifted and influential theologians of the third century. Now, here's the other part. Origen chose to be a eunuch. Yes, that's right. He chose to have that happen to him. So what did the church do? Remember, this is the early church still, third century. What did the church do? The church ordained him to be a pastor and to be a theologian proclaiming the good news of God in Jesus Christ. This stuff is messy. Our human lives together as community are messy. Do I understand it all? 100% no. But there it is. What's that mean for us? If we listen to the gospel reading this morning, Jesus is very clear. You're not the vine, people. I'm the vine. You get your sustenance from me. You're the branches. And the branches are meant to produce fruit. And that fruit is the love of God. Lived out in every single way. And those ways may look different for each of us. If we listen to the first John text, again, we hear this continual call to love. And that we're not called to a black and white world, but rather to be liberated in the gospel, freed in the gospel, that we belong to God and are loved by God, that we can do our fruit, which is loving others. Which is not judging others. Philip gives us a vision of what that looks like. The Holy Spirit called and prompted him. He went. He proclaimed the gospel, the good news. And then the eunuch says, what is to hold me back? Because remember, I've been to Jerusalem and I was held back from full entrance into the temple to the worship of God. What's to hold me back from being baptized? What happens in baptism, folks? Do we remember this? This is root in our identity. In baptism, we are yoked. We are connected eternally to Jesus' death and resurrection. We are given new life. We are given eternal life. We are claimed by God. What's to hold me back? He was baptized that day. Who do we hold back? Who do we lean into with our black and white thinking? And who's the Holy Spirit calling us to go to? The scriptures point us to the radicalness of God's love. That God wants to be lavish in loving others. To deconstruct the barriers that we too often put up. And to greet people with love. Now, does that mean anything goes? Okay, let's be real. This might be a little uncomfortable. We come up with all kinds of things about other people. And then we'll wink and nod when we have a... 
having multiple relationships with multiple people that the person is not married to, and we call it, he's just sowing his oats. Boys will be boys. We're okay with that in our culture. It's just what we do. Sleeping around is just second nature, right? By the way, I, I am aware that this happens through all generations. We have this freedom until it's about something that we declare on the black and white list that we don't like. What happens if instead of getting caught up in all that stuff, we focus on following where Jesus calls us to love? To meet people with love, even when we don't understand everything. Even when we're uncomfortable. Where will the Holy Spirit prompt us to live the love of God in Jesus Christ? This speaks to us today concerning sexuality and gender, race, economic status, language, ethnicities, abilities, disabilities, ageisms, all of it. All the ways that we put barriers up to see the Holy Spirit's knocking them down, saying, don't let the barriers stand between you and the other. Engage in love. Speak the grace of God in Jesus Christ. This morning, the church council hosted a commissions and cake event. Some of you were able to attend this morning, looking at the vision, mission, and the calling of the church, the commissions that will be about. And in that, in the table I was at, there was conversation about how people are sharing love, God's love. And it looks different in so many ways. We can talk the meta-narrative and the giant systems, but it all comes down to how do you live it in your daily life. Two folks said they go to Walmart. How many like Walmart? How many go to Walmart? I dread Walmart. Oh, I have so many reasons to dread it. Well, these two go, and you know what they started doing? Good morning, or not. God loves you. And if they smile, they may even get the offer of a hug. That is their way of sharing love. And they've got some 40 folks now that they've encountered where they share acceptance in that way. In that way, someone is seeing the love of God. Another person shared, and these folks didn't know they'd be part of the sermon, so I'm not giving their names. But another shared that she picked up the, so these little rubber or plastic little Jesuses that she saw around Easter time and she'll encounter somebody and that she'll have conversations with this I think you need a little Jesus and it's her way of expressing love to someone and she says so far nobody's thrown it back out at me you getting the idea? The Holy Spirit prompts each and every one of us to use our gifts to bear the fruit of love into this world. Not to be the gatekeepers of the gospel, but to be the proclaimers. We don't come in here for safety to be part of a club. We come in here to be fired up by God's love for our lives that we go out and live it and be it. Where's the Holy Spirit sending us? Who is the Holy Spirit calling us to sit with and share with and welcome into fellowship? Acts is about action. Each of us is called to action with the gospel of Jesus Christ to be the church that the Holy Spirit continues to prompt and nudge and form and grow. And it's all about the good news of God's love in Jesus poured out for us. How will you act this week? Amen.